For over 40 years, Rabbi Noah Weinberg has been helping Jews of all backgrounds discover the wisdom and beauty of their heritage. Rabbi Noah was born and raised in New York City. He studied at Johns Hopkins and Loyola Universities and received his rabbinical ordination at the Nair Yisrael Rabbinical College in Baltimore. Today, he resides with his Rebetzin in the heart of Jerusalem. With his trademark warmth, wisdom, and love for all people, Rabbi Noah has become everyone's rabbi touching the hearts of Jews from all walks of life across the globe. Of course. Of course. Definitely friendly. <laughs> people, friendly. People. Is that a question? We're friendly people. <laughs> if you're not friendly, you're nobody and you're losing out on all the fun of life. Being friendly is really important. Making everyone feel welcome and it's a great, great thing. Absolutely, because I want to be treated kindly and with respect. And if you don't treat others kindly with respect, they'll never see you in that way. When you're friendly to someone, you can make their day and make them feel like a like hundred times better than they feel. And, and it just boosts their self-esteem. Should I be friendly to people? Everyone should be friendly to people. I think that's going to be the, uh, the answer to world peace. You should be friendly to every human being, except the guy who's trying to kill you. And that, that is the uh, society. We have to live with society. In Judaism, we say you should love every human being except the guy who's trying to kill you. You should love them. You should know how gorgeous every human being is. And I try to show people how gorgeous human beings are. I say, look, if you're, if you're traveling in, in Romania, you know, and you don't know the language, and you're trying to buy a Coke, and, and they don't even understand what the heck you're talking about, and you can't understand them, and you're yelling at each other, and, and then you hear somebody speaking broken English in the background, yeah? You turn and you say, my friend, where are you from? What a pleasure. Well, how did you get here? Well, hey, let's sit down and have a Coke. Why? He's gorgeous. He speaks English, and you speak English. You know, people who can speak English, a human being, who can speak English is gorgeous when there's none around. Yeah. But when you come to New York and all of them are babbling English, bam, 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 you say, get out of here, too many of you, scram. Yeah. Look, every human being is absolutely gorgeous. They want to be good. They'll die to be good. They want to understand. They want to live. They want to love their children. They want, they want pleasure. They are live beings they're in the image of god you got to be able to appreciate it that's all but friendly that's the only way you can you can have social intercourse you're friendly you help everybody that's not love yet it's just plain and simple the oil of the grease that society works on By being the best person that they could be. You have to love yourself first. Do favors for everyone. Uh, smile. So if you walk around always positive and always trying to please other people, even in the slightest way of just smiling at them, then that can really, that's how people just start to like you. We have to be able to give our, of ourselves in order to be able to receive. For other people to love you, you just have to be honest with yourself. You can't make someone love you, you just make yourself someone that's lovable. Don't look bad at yourself, because if you look bad at yourself, other people will look bad at you. You want people to love you? Love them. There's no greater gift than love. There's no greater gift than love. But you know, the easiest way to get people to love you, and the cheapest way, you know, gifts cost money. The cheapest way is <laughs> compliments. Now, flattery will get you everywhere. You know, flattery, you just lord it on, flattery. You can, it can get you everywhere. People fall for flattery. It's forbidden. You're not allowed. It's bad. In Judaism, we say, don't flatter, because you're twisting reality for people. You're giving them compliments that aren't real. But honest compliments buys people's souls. You see somebody doing something right, something good, something intelligent, something beautiful. And you say, wow, that was beautiful. I, 
I really appreciate what you did. <laughs> Man, everybody will love you. You just spread it around. Compliments, honest compliments. But you have to look. It makes an effort. It takes an effort. It's well worth it. Very well worth it. To be nice, to smile, to understand people's willingness to listen to them. One who's filled with joy at all times will be surrounded by people. So, you know, if you want to try it out to see whether it works, you know, there's a kiosk on your way to work. Every morning, just go by. You don't have to buy anything there, yeah? But every morning, you go by, yeah? Say, good morning, a new stand. Say, good morning, how are you this morning? Just say that. Every morning, you're just going by anyway. It costs nothing. Good morning. <laughs> Then one day, walk another way. The next day you come by and you say, good morning. The guy is sure to ask you, hey, where were you yesterday? Are you feeling okay? <laughs> what, what, what happened? What did you do to him? You gave him a compliment? What did you do? He said, good morning. You notice that he's alive. <laughs> People are living on your pleasure. You notice he's alive. He thinks you're a great guy. <laughs> and then, of course, that much to say good morning with feeling and with, with a feeling of, of good wishes. That's the way you'll be loved. You'll be liked. Give compliments. <laughs> Name your own ticket. Flattery will get you everywhere. Don't do it. By loving himself. By giving, acting like you love him. By trying to overlook as much as possible. You try to see the good in everybody. I wish I could say that for myself. It necessitates one being able, first of all, to respect and honor his, himself or herself. And then and only then can I, am I able to love another human being. The first thing that you got to do is you got to define love. <laughs> so the strangest thing is, that the Jewish people, we say it's a commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. Reyachah means your friend as yourself. You're supposed to love humanity, every human being. You're supposed to love every human being. The Almighty loves every human being. You're supposed to love every human being. So you find in the world at large, you ask somebody, should you love nice neighbors? Yes, you should. Is it the right thing to do? Yes, it's the right thing to do. Is it a good thing to do? Yes, it's a good thing to do. Can I obligate you to love someone? No, you can't obligate me to love someone. I, I can't obligate you. Well, you said you should. Are you obligated to do what you should? You said it's the right thing to do. Are you obligated to do the right thing or you can do the wrong thing? You said that it's a good thing to do. Are you obligated to do the good things? I said there's a confusion. Right? There's a confusion. In Judaism, we say it's an obligation. Now, Authority doesn't help you. I mean, I, I, my telling you it's an obligation. The Torah is telling you it's an obligation. You don't feel the obligation. You say, I don't, I don't, I, I don't buy that. So we ask you, tell me, if you have two kids, yeah, and one says, I hate my sister. So you say, it happens? Or you say, you got to love a sister. Well, you got to love a sister. How can I love a brat like that? Don't talk that way about your sister. I'm always telling you the truth. <laughs> you smack him, you lost your temper. Now you got to explain to him, how do you love? But you know, it's an obligation. You should love your own sister. You should love, even if she took the last piece of cake. <laughs> right? The Almighty wants us to love each other, every one of us. By being in relationships and to continually understand this concept and to work on it. The more you give, the more you can love. You have to learn to love others by believing in yourself. So how do you do it? How do you define love? You gotta define love. You can't define love. Tell me, do you love your father? Yes. Do you love your mother? Yes. Do you love your sister? Yes. Do you love your brother? Yes. Do you love your kids? Yes. Do you love the mechanic that ripped you off? No. Do you love the landlord that won't fix your, your furnace? No. Well, uh, do you about full stick your father? I don't know what you're talking about. Just tell me, do I, I can't tell you, I don't. When you say you love your father, you know what you're talking about. So you have a definition. Love is, um, I don't know. 
losing your breath when you see someone, uh, undying devotion for something, the same kind of feeling that you feel for your immediate family. You want to do things for them that'll make them happy and you care about them and you trust them and you respect them. So let us tell you the Jewish definition of love and you check it out whether that's what you mean. The Jewish definition of love is, it's an emotion. You all agree, it's an emotion, it's a feeling. It's an emotion of pleasure. When you look at your kids, you look at the people you love, it, it can bring pain, but it's an emotion, basically, of pleasure. It's the greatest pleasure we have. It's our children. We get married because we're in love. It's a pleasure. So it's an emotion of pleasure that we human beings have when we see. See means appreciate, understand, can perce perceive a virtue. Virtue is anything gorgeous, strong, meaningful in another human being and we identify that human being with his virtue. When two people can't get enough of each other. Love is an industry. Love is a poem. Love is a, a, an ocean. Love is a universe. So first you've got to articulate the definition. Then you've got to check it out whether that's what you mean, that's, that's what you're doing when you love. Then you've got to figure out how in the world to do this for every human being and you can love humanity. I think it just happens. It just happens, you know? Yeah, you don't always choose them, you find them. Um, best friends are really hard to come by and to choose. So the first thing that you have to look for in a friend is a commitment, a loyalty. To what? To living. You don't want a loyalty to play tennis every Sunday. <laughs> if, but if he doesn't come every Sunday, drop him too. But that's not what a friend is. A friend is for living together. To tell you where you're making a mistake, you tell him. To discuss problems, to discuss things that really bother you. Like, what is really life about? You thought about it, he thought about it. Well, did you ever talk to anybody about it? Yeah, sometimes, but get a friend, discuss it. How do you take care of your wife? You have problems with your children. You want to know how to use your potential. You got a piece of wisdom. Share it with a friend. It's for life. A friendship is for life. Two are better than one. Two heads are better than one. Don't go alone. Make it a team. If you can get three friends, you're much better off. But if you really want to win, make a circle of ten friends and all for one and one for all and you'll be great. I would choose a best friend on personality and character traits. A best friend is someone who I choose is personally that I grew up with them and they've been for, there for me. One who can challenge you and stimulate you to grow. One who tells you when you're wrong and, and you, you can accept that. By seeing if they cares for you as much as you care for yourself. So real friendship is commitment. Commitment to what? To life. You have to find out what kind of life does your friend want to live. Look around. Don't let it be a happening. Choose your friend. Kind of like a marriage and we need to Give and work it out listening. listening. Someone who lends you money and forgets how you're home. And, you know, that's, that's a real good friend. When you really gotta call somebody, when you're when you're dead up, you know, when you're hot up against the wall, you gotta give somebody a call, and that's that's your friend. Best friend is the one you have since you're 12 years old. I think that true friendship is when two people trust each other and they have a great time together and they can depend on each other. They have to give you lots of compliments and again lots of candy, and that makes you Food. a good friend. I just bought her a bagel. What makes a good friend? We have a story in Jewish consciousness that there were these two friends, you know, they were born in Jerusalem, they went to Cheder together, and they grew up, and they got married. One went to live in Rome, the other went to live in the uh, Byzantine Empire. You know, they had two emperors, a Roman emperor of the East and a Roman emperor of the West. And they would do business to, with each other because they, they were good friends and they were wealthy people, they would do business with each other. So one day this fellow from Rome comes to uh, Constantinople on his business trip and he's accused of being a spy. He's accused of being a spy, some 
bad people who've framed him, whatever it is, and he's put in front of the emperor, and the emperor says, death sentence. He's take him out to die. So he says, can I do one thing, you know, my, 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 my family doesn't know where I am, and what, what will happen to me, and I owe people money, and people owe me money, and it'll, they'll be ruined for no reason. I'm not a spy, but please, give me, give me uh, 60 days to settle my affairs. I'll go to Rome. I'll take care of everything, and then I'll come back and you'll put me to death. <laughs> You're going to come back to be put to death. Come on, don't be an idiot. He said, well, I have a guarantor. I have somebody here in Constantinople that will be a guarantor. He'll stay in jail. He'll wait for me. And if I don't come back, he'll, he'll be willing to go to be put to death in my stead. The emperor said, what are you? <laughs> go ahead, bring me your guarantor. I want to see something like that. So he brings in the guarantor, his old friend, his friend, said, no problem, he's going to stay in jail, he'll wait, and the emperor says, I know there's one crackpot, let me see if you're going to come back, go ahead, you got 60 days. So off he goes, he runs, gets a boat, goes to Rome, tells his family what happened, and he tells them where the money is, and who owes him money, and what they did, and he starts off in good enough time to come back before the 60 days are up, and he, he's, he's, he, he has no, no question he's going to make it. But those were days of sails, you know, <laughs> sails, no wind, be calm. One day, two days, five days, and he's losing time, and he's worried about his friend, what's going to be? Finally, the wind comes up, he hits shore, he buys a pack of horses, he kills one horse running and another horse running and another horse running and finally he gets there but it's dawn of the 60th day and he runs in but they already took out his his friend and they're going to execute him he runs up to the executioner and he says hey you're making a mistake i'm the spy he's just the guarantor i'm back i go ah oh, you gotta kill me <laughs> the executioner takes a look at him and he's sure but it makes sense. He's a spy. What is it? This is just a guarantor. So he lets the friend go. He says, okay, we'll kill you. The friend says, no, nah, he was late. I'm the guarantor. I'm the guy you got to kill. He doesn't get killed. It's me. And they're fighting it out. And there's a big tumult in the whole town. And the emperor hears the tumult. And the emperor says, what's going on? They tell the emperor what's going on. He calls them both in. And they argue in front of the emperor. And the emperor says to them, you know what? I'll let you both go on one condition. You make me a third friend. And this is what the Torah says. Love your neighbor as yourself. I am God. If you love your neighbor as yourself, then make me a third friend. You see, the after the Reyach is not a neighbor, it's a friend. The Almighty says, make me a third friend. Well, let's see some guy's got pain because he got shot in like his right arm. So I guess you gotta like punch him in the left arm. He won't feel it anymore. Give him painkillers. By letting him hear what he wants to hear, not the truth. Empathize with their situation and to just try to understand and just try to be there for them. Feel for him. Feel for him more, more on the level that he's, he's a fellow man and he needs you right now. I mean, the first thing of helping people in pain is like we have a custom it's a, it's a, a law in Judaism that when somebody loses a loved one, he says, shiver. And people come to comfort the mourners. That's what it's called, michum avelim, to comfort the mourners. So the law is you sit down, and if the mourner, if the person, the bereaved, doesn't speak, you just sit there, and you just sit there, and you should sit there. You're not supposed to start the conversation. He's got to start the conversation. If he starts the conversation, then you go on. But if not, you sit there for 5, 10, 15 minutes, as much as time as you allotted, and then you get up and you say, may the Almighty comfort you amongst the mourners of Zion. So what did you do for those 15 minutes? You were there. And that is a leaving his pain. Human beings are social creatures. We're all one. The fact that someone is with me when I'm in pain and cares about it and feels for it helps all of us, helps every human being that's in pain. And I want you to know, the same thing goes the other way. If you have joy, you know, you're marrying off your kid. 
nobody shows up, <laughs> that's pretty bad, yeah? People show up and they say, wonderful, mazel tov, and they, you feel that joy, you feel they're participating in your joy, your joy is much better. We're all one, we're all humanity. Understand their sorrow. Talk to them, help them. Just to let them know that uh, you understand what he's going through. When you hear an ambulance going by, the, the, the Jewish custom is that you say a prayer for whoever it is, whoever needs this ambulance, yeah? Because a human being is suffering. And when we hear that somebody is killed or wounded or uh, by terrorists or by accidents, to just say uh, terrible without a moment feeling the pain that's going on with these people who are wounded and hurting or the people who are bereaved or the, and that, that is inhuman. Now we know this, you see, we know this, that when we're suffering and people just walk by, we know this is terrible, but we know it even more. If you see somebody hit by a car, right there you see him hit by a car, and you just walk by and you say, you know, somebody will take care of him, and unless you're afraid of getting sued or whatever it is, or, or hurting the guy, you pick him up, you put him into your car, you rush him to the hospital because you know you should feel his pain. We, we are one, yeah? We are one. Now, if people would feel the pain of the, of the starving Ethiopians or if people would feel the pain of the Israelis that are being attacked with terror attacks and children killed and, and mothers killed, if people would feel the pain of the spots of the of the of the of, of people who are who are mugged and beaten and raped if they would feel that pain they would take action they would take action and that action would improve all of us would improve mankind well as long as the friend's willing to willing to help himself then you can be there for him and show him what, what works for you. Try to talk to them just as a friend to a friend. Tell him what he has to improve in. Everybody knows his friend. There's something holding him back. You know, look at every one of your friends and you say, he's got so much intelligence, he's got so much drive. He's got, what is it that's lacking? And you come to the conclusion, he has bad judgment. So what can you do to help him get bad, good judgment, you know? Uh, give him a book about good judgment or one of the 48 ways, be deliberate, you know, you give him and uh, ask him, you know, what do you think of it? Don't, don't tell him, read this, you need it, because that's not, you have to think what's going to be effective, yeah? But you have friends, you have children, you have relatives that you know could be much greater than they are. They need somebody from the outside help to lift them. If you take the time to think what is holding them back and then give them a way to overcome it, then you're, you're really helping people. That's, that's even more than charity. That's really helping people to be independent. Be like active with them, help them. Can they correct what you're doing wrong without uh, hurting your feelings? People who ask for advice and we say that one of the things that you should do is if you want to accept you want to enjoy being given criticism don't wait for it to happen yeah ask for it it's much easier to take yeah so if people in the jewish tradition jewish consciousness when you come before rosh hashanah you ask five of your friends tell me what am i doing that's wrong what am I doing that's wrong? Uh, you know, what mistakes am I making? What should I improve? And they would give you, you know, we, we know, like, uh, three pieces of advice are throwaways. They just want to know whether you're going to knock their head off, yeah? But the fourth and the fifth and the sixth, and you listen to that. They're telling you what really they see is your faults, yeah? Now, if five of your friends tell you the same thing, that what, you're too arrogant, you're too arrogant, you're too arrogant, you're too arrogant, then you better listen, yeah? So if you ask for advice, that's great. But really, when you're giving other people advice and you say, what's wrong, what's holding them back? It's the most important to ask yourself, okay, one piece of criticism, he, he really, uh, 
He's too uh, short with people, another piece of criticism. But look for the one that would make the really the most difference on him. Just be a great role model for him. He just held him out anytime he needs it. Try to emphasize their positive characteristics and just be there for them and just try to have a good time with them. If you have any questions or any comments, anything at all, we're interested. Please call.